Well, I'm very delighted to welcome you to St George's uh, for this very auspicious occasion, um, which is, of course, the inaugural lecture of uh, uh, Professor Pollock. And um, it's great to see that a lot of people in the curve. It's nice to be back together, isn't it, in, in person. And also, there's a lot of people out there, out there, who have tuned in. So you have to imagine the rest of the crowd. In fact, the crowd out there is bigger than the crowd in here. But it's a crowd. So it's, I welcome all the people online. It's great you're all you come for this. And um, inaugural lectures are great things. I, I love inaugural lectures. I go to everybody's inaugural lecture. It's such a, um, uh, a milestone, a time when people can, it marks their promotion, of course, but it, it's a time for them to look back on the people who've mentored them, uh, the people who've helped them, the incidents that happened. How, what their research has done, how it's evolved, how it's grown, and where it might be going uh, in, the, uh, in the future. And um, it's a time for celebration, uh, and it's time um, for, uh, for family and friends. And it's good to see so many people from uh, Richard's family friends in the, in the audience, and not to mention his colleagues. Um, so, uh, so, Richard is actually the professor in gastro. He's the um, professor of practice in gastroenterology and gastrointestinal infection. And we'll come back to that in a minute. And so, just to go over a bit of history, I, I'm, I think I might be saying that uh, he graduated from Barts uh, in 1989. And he's been interested in infection from the word go. I understand he did a BSc in infection and immunity. He may tell us about all this. Uh, and then he took the diploma in tropical medicine up in Liverpool, which is very famous. Uh, got a very prestigious Wellcome Trust Clinical Research Training Fellowship um, and um, shot off to Zambia, I think, to study immune responses and parasitic infection. So um, th this, is, this is really interesting if you happen to be like me, an infectious diseases person. So that, that's absolutely fascinating. And I think for his doctoral work, he got a prize, I believe, from the uh, quite a prestigious prize, from the Digestive Disease Foundation Charity. And then sometime later, uh, he became a consultant at St George's Hospital and an honorary senior lecturer uh, at the university. Uh, and he's been really uh, run a lot of research since then. He's been quite a galvanizer of research. And he's published, I think, in excess of 150 papers in big journals, Lancet, Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, and other specialty journals, uh, gastroenterology and the like. And he's, he's well cited. I think uh, there were over 3,000 citations, uh, and um, I'm not trying to embarrass you, but I'm <laughs> going to carry on. Uh, and he leads um, uh, lots of local endeavours uh, and national endeavours. He leads the, the predominant uh, research group looking at irritable bowel syndrome epidemiology in the UK, and he's got collaborations. I've got a long list of people who he's been collaborating with, both in the UK and indeed around the world. So. Um, that's, uh, that's great. And in the local environment, he, he's been a, a chair of the South uh, London Gastric Intestinal Clinical Research Network and involved in the national one. He's been involved in driving national guidelines. Um, uh, he's worked with many people through the uh, British Society of Gastroenterology, with the Royal College of Physicians, with all sorts of people, with NICE and the like. Uh, and he's been a real galvanizer of uh, research around St George's, clinical research, I think the numbers of patients that are in clinical research and the increase that there's been since the time Richard's been here it is really very, very noticeable. I'm told that uh, outside work, uh, I, 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 in fact, he, I know this a little bit, he likes to sail and he likes the garden and he likes the occasional glass of wine, I'm told. That's actually a, a little anecdote. The first time I, well, it's not the first time, Richard, but the first time I can remember reading Richard it was between when I was appointed here and when I um, took up the job and we ended up at a dinner party next to each other and so um, and it was great company and I thought oh, I, I definitely made the right choice coming to Georgia. Yeah. So it's um, a great great pleasure uh, to <coughs> now invite Professor Pollock to, to deliver his, his uh, inaugural lecture which is entitled Parasites and Populations. Thank you. 
Thank, thank you, John. That's a very kind introduction. Um, I, before I forget, thank you to uh, John Appleyard, June Phillips, Caroline, and all the team who helped set up this lecture. Uh, and not to forget like, the student ambassador outside in the blue shirt. Thank you. Um, I'm very grateful for you joining me. Those of you in person, um, it's nice to talk to people face to face. Um, it makes all the difference when you're giving a lecture. And to all the 900 people who have come. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, this screen here, by the way, is to prevent anyone coming up and slapping me. That's <laughs> uh, just a little deterrent we've introduced. Um, so um, I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey through my, my career path um, and give you some reflections on the way. But don't worry, I'm going to try and keep it as light as possible. So uh, where, where did it all begin? The young researcher. <laughs> It's not clear when he first developed his interest in gastrointestinal diseases, but this may have been the first moment when he uh, discovered his interest in waterborne diseases. Uh, and as John mentioned, I trained at St Bartholomew's, and I'm very grateful to have the textbook here, Dr Clark and Professor Kumar in front row. I feel very honoured they've uh, taken the time to come see me. Um, and we'll talk more, more about so perhaps in a little bit. Um, so I trained as a medical student there, an undistinguished career. I spent more time acting than uh, studying. Not always as diligent as I perhaps should have been, but I do happen to remember very early in my training uh, being in a lecture. I, hope to, I don't want to embarrass you, Pauline. Professor Kumar brought a patient with her to a lecture who had inflammatory bowel disease my first year of arts and I remember that to this day and somehow I think that must have stuck at the back of my head. Uh, so here the young researcher, um, he did his uh, medical elective for the Save the Children Fund in Pakistan. This is in the northwest frontier province and this is up in the Karakoram Highway in a place called Hunza. And so I think that gave me a little bit of an itch to travel. Then uh, an integrated BSc uh, at St Mary's Hospital, as was then, where I did a, a, a degree in immunology and infection. Um, and in case you don't know, this is uh, Alexander Fleming's uh, uh, lab just there. I worked with, a, uh, I had a lecturer <coughs> called Professor Brent, who he'd been uh, Peter Medawa's PhD student, Peter Medawa, Nobel laureate. And he asked deceptively simple questions and issues. It's obvious, it's easy. But when you thought about the question, you realised there was no straightforward answer. And this was maybe the point when I realised how important it is to pose the right research question. On to the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Had a great time here. Um, wonderful people uh, who come from all sorts of exciting places all over the world. And I had an itch to work abroad and travel. Um, and I very nearly ended up working in Nepal uh, for a variety of reasons that, that didn't happen. Uh, and in the end, I was persuaded to stay in the UK and do my postgraduate exams. And I was then lucky enough to get a job at the Hospital for Tropical Diseases. So, while at the Hospital for Tropical Diseases, I, um, I published my first piece of research. At the time, I really didn't appreciate how fortunate I was to be involved in writing the first case series of a newly described parasite, uh, which was published in The Lancet. Um, actually, maybe I should stop there because really my career has been downhill. <laughs> uh, and so this organism, now John, can I do a pointer with this or I'll just use my red pointer? Is that one of the use a red pointer? I'll use my red pointer. So this is the, this, it was, at the time it was called cyanobacterium like body, later called cyclospora, and it caused persistent diarrhea, um, 
waterborne infection common in places like the pool, you know, travellers to Kathmandu and the like. Um, so I was I was off the blocks with my research. I then went on to uh, work at Chelsea and Westminster with Brian Gazzard, um, who's a great influence on me, something of an eccentric, prone to conducting walled rounds entirely in French, lighting up cigarettes spontaneously while he was speaking to one of our patients um, and setting the fire alarm off. Um, and I had learned soon that I needed to bring, read the New England Journal of Medicine before the Thursday ward round mm -hmm. because he was sure to ask me a question about the latest paper in HIV. The job taught me, I think, a new way to interact with my patients, a more collaborative style, less patriarchal, and I've tried to carry that with me ever since. And it was also my first experience of dealing with a pandemic. Um, and I'm still haunted by all those young men that died. Um, during my time there, I actually pu published an article on enteric viruses that cause diarrhea. And this um, unwittingly was my first brush with coronavirus. Um, and I'm pleased to see this paper has now been cited much more than it ever was since the pandemic. Um, so Brian Gazza was actually a gastroenterologist, um, and I think this was the start of my segue into gastroenterology. I also had the good fortune to meet my uh, colleague, Dr. Neil, who um, is my esteemed colleague sitting out in the audience. So then I returned to the alma mater, to Bart's in the Royal London, to do my PhD uh, where I was a Wellcome Trust Fellow, uh, working with Michael Farthing in the bottom right-hand corner, who's very young here, and um, he, he was a, a great um, boss. He was fantastically busy, um, but he was a great supporter and mentor of his research fellows, and I learned so much from him. Uh, and I also met so many other wonderful people during my period of research, too numerous to mention all of them. But uh, some of them joined us today, Dr. Clark, Professor Kumar, Annie Ballinger, David Rampton, Andy Veach, uh, soon to be president of the BSG, and Sarah McCartney sitting over here on the left. Uh, it was great times, actually. So uh, this um, is actually an electron micrograph that appears in my PhD thesis, uh, an in vitro model of cryptosporium problem. Um, and we uh, developed this model and found that gamma interferon could act directly on epithelial cells to inhibit infection. And this effect was lost in cell lines that didn't express gamma interferon receptors. And if you block signal uh, transduction with the Janus kinase inhibitor, you could block infection. And quite remarkably, JAK inhibitors now form part of uh, treatment in inflammatory bowel disease, and that was 30 years ago. So, um, onwards and upwards, uh, uh, on to the next slide. So, uh, uh, as, as, as John mentioned, by serendipity, I met the inventor of a drug, an antimicrobial drug called nitazoxanide. Um, and through that, pathway, we were able to set up some randomised controlled trials in Zambia uh, with Paul Kelly, someone I know John's work with uh, uh, did his research with himself. Uh, and it was a study of um, using this drug for AIDS-related persistent diarrhea in Lusaka, and this is University Teaching Hospital Lusaka. It taught me actually how difficult randomised controlled trials are to set up. And I have to admit the study was slightly flawed because it relied on patients self-reporting their diarrhoea. And since they had no other form of access to medical care, they tended to overestimate their diarrhoea in order to be eligible for the study. <coughs> I realise that whilst you're a student, working abroad sounds very glamorous and exciting. But when you have a wife and two young children, you start to see the difficulties uh, with working abroad. And so by this circuitous route, <coughs> I came to work at St George's. I was appointed a consultant, honorary senior lecturer, 
gastroenterology in 2002. It is certainly a steep learning curve as a consultant, and I don't mind admitting I found it difficult in the first few years, but I was still keen to keep up my research endeavours. Uh, and after a brief foray into proteomics with uh, Professor Sanjeev Krishna, I realised that working as a full-time NHS consultant, I now had to lay aside my Eppendorf um, pipettes uh, and think about other approaches to doing uh, clinical research beyond the lab. Um, so, um, I recommend research, even if you're a medical clinician, because it's intellectually stimulating. It keeps you balanced and on the path and stops you going a bit insane if you just do clinical work on your own. Um, and research feeds into the benefit of your patients in so many ways. Um, and really, what's not to like? I, I, I recommend it all. So this was Somehow I found my way through into the world of IBD and epidemiology. And this was the first paper uh, that uh, I published, Bridging Infectious Diseases and in IBD, a study using the hospital episode statistic, an NHS administrative data. Come on through. Um, so in this study, we found a concurrent infection, C. diff, in patients with inflammatory bowel disease led to an increased risk of surgery and an increase in mortality. Um, at the time, my co-authors pointed out to me how bad I was at writing research papers, but I did begin to appreciate how population-based research had something to offer. Uh, and this was the first project that eventually became uh, part of the group of what we now call ourselves uh, as uh, POP IBD or the Population IBD Study Group. So, this is uh, some of the members of POP IBD. Um, uh, some of the, uh, the members of the group have accused me of being something of a dilettante when it comes to epidemiology. But since I've had um, the support of all of these wonderful people, who are experts in their field, uh, somehow we've managed to have a very productive research output. Um, uh, it's only relatively recently that we've branded ourselves POP IBD, and I think this is quite a good idea for people who started taking more notice of the work. Um, most of our work has been done using the Clinical Practice Research Database, which is a uh, large nationally representative UK-based <coughs> data set, research validated, derived from primary care interactions. Um, and just to mention the members of the group, Professor Saxena, Professor of Primary Care, Irene Peterson, Professor of Epidemiology at UCH, and also has an appointment in Copenhagen, all good epidemiologists come from uh, Copenhagen, Alex Bottle, Professor of Statistics at Imperial College, Zee Majee, Professor of Public Health and Primary Care at Imperial College, and Matthew <coughs> Bostock. He's the one on the right, in case you're <laughs> <laughs> So, for the uninitiated, a quick description of inflammatory bowel disease. So, it, it is an idiopathic condition. We don't know what causes it. It's not to be confused with irritable bowel syndrome, many people do, IBD as opposed to IBS. It's a long-term chronic relapsing condition of the gut comprising two main subtypes, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And it has a prevalence approaching 1% of the UK population. Um, and disease activity in IBD can be cumulative and can lead ultimately to complications and the requirement for surgery. And this is the natural history of the disease. And we try to initiate treatment early, treating acute flares, often with steroids, and giving more long-term medications to modify the immune response, such as thiopurine. Thiopurines like acetyapurine and captopurine. So that's your, that's your background. So, 
I can't talk about the research without talking about the research fellows. You are the stars of the show, really, tonight. Um, and a shout out to each of them. So Ben Kepsen from mine, who can't be here tonight, who's actually a professor himself in Leeds, um, who's had some hardships of his own. And I hope you're out there somewhere, Ben Kep, but good evening and I hope you're well. Sue Chatty, who's now a consultant at King's College, um, well, um, took on the mantle from Venkat. Chris Alexakis, who's in the audience, who's now a consultant in Guildford. Lizette Chaya, who took on the mantle from Chris, who's now a consultant at Worthing. Johnny Blackwell, training in South London until very recently, at training at St George's. Nish Chasuri, training in North East Thames. And Sammy Bailey, who's got a logie, who's taking it over from Nish. Collectively, they're called the Ivy League Boffins. This is their WhatsApp um, picture. This is Johnny explaining about coding. Between Johnny and Sammy in the background. <laughs> so, um, steroids. steroids have been the mainstay of treatment in inflammatory bowel disease flares for more than half a century. But they can cause serious harm. Many a wide range of side effects particularly if used inappropriately or persistently, currently what's known as steroid dependency. And most treatments that we use, the modern treatments we use now, are designed to minimise, cut out the leave of steroids if possible. So one of our first pieces of work I did with Venka was a meta-analysis of the post-operative infectious complications associated with steroid use in inflammatory bowel disease. And this is actually one of my most cited papers. Probably has been around for so long. Um, but you can see here there's a twofold increase in infectious complications if you're on IBD. And this is the informing management to this day. We try and get our patients off steroids if we can and get them onto nutritional therapies instead if at all possible. We went on to do more work on steroids with Vivek. And we you would have thought that with the introduction of new treatments for IBD, the steroid use might have fallen. <coughs> but using CPRD, we assessed the trends in steroid use and steroid dependency over a 20 year period. Um, we compared steroid use in the earliest era and in the latest era of the study. And you can see here for Crohn's disease that steroid dependency had dropped over the period. But for the ulcerative colitis, steroid use had <coughs> actually increased. And since we did this study, we and others have conducted the National Steroid Audit led by Christian Selinger. And I think this has led to identification of the processes which reduce uh, unnecessary use of steroids, including the uh, widespread use of MTTs, inflammatory bowel disease, multidisciplinary team meetings, virtual biologic clinics joint surgical clinics and so forth. And I think I like things maybe changing. So next to discuss the impact of thiopurins, these drugs that we use long term for the maintenance of remission uh, and uh, their impact on surgical requirements in inflammatory bowel disease. We know that IBD can cause accumulative inflammation and series of flares and this particularly pertains to Crohn's disease, but it's probably also relevant for ulcerative colitis, you know, stricturing, fistula formation, and this can lead on to the need for surgery and progressive disability and damage to the digestive tract, uh, including perianal disease, um, which is one of the most uh, horrible aspects of the disease. Um, so we asked ourselves uh, the question, could thiopurine treatment uh, maintain remission, that, that we know maintains remission in IBD, modify disease progression and bowel damage in the long run, and thereby reduce the requirement of surgery over the long period of the disease, uh, the life, it is a lifelong condition. So uh, this was our first uh, piece of work with uh, Sue Chatu. Um, and uh, in essence, what this slide shows is that um, in the more modern era, we have used more and more um, uh, thiopurin. 
And concurrently with that, uh, the risk of surgery has steadily fallen. So there was an association between the use of these drugs and um, the risk of surgery. And then we went on to look at all of these things in a logistic regression. Um, and so prolonged use uh, for more than 12 months with a thiopurine will reduce the risk of surgery or that uh, the associated risk. Um, and we went on to look at other people's work in this meta-analysis, uh, which confirmed our findings um, that long-term thiopurines reduced the risk of surgery, intestinal surgery. And we went on to do a whole bunch of studies looking also at osteocolitis, perianal disease, uh, the different uh, impact of the drug in the young children, adolescents, young people, and the elderly. Um, and uh, I'm quite proud of this work because I, I was pleased to be reading an excellent review edited by Elsa Hart, who's in the audience, who's just come out in gastroenterology entitled Disease Modification in Inflammatory Bowel Disease. So we were thinking about this. Thank you, and I used to talk about it way back. And um, I think it's still very much a, a, a hot issue. And I think the newer drugs, like the anti-TNF drugs that we use, actually the evidence base, they change the long-term progression of disease is actually much weaker. Um, we need more evidence. And I'm pleased to see there's a new thing called the spirit consensus. Uh, there's a defined outcomes for disease modification trials, which I think are probably long overdue to be honest in our field. Um, it's still unclear if early treatment or persistent treatment is key to uh, modifying the natural history of IBD. Um, that's all ahead of us still. So uh, on to smoking. So smoking is one of the relatively few environmental factors that we know about uh, that can uh, impact inflammatory bowel disease. So um, uh, we looked at smoking status and smoking cessation in Crohn's disease. Um, and uh, we found in essence that um, smokers were more likely to have steroid dependency and two thirds more likely to undergo intestinal surgery. Uh, and nicely illustrated in this KM curve. Uh, and uh, importantly, smoking cessation reduced these effects sizably. Uh, Johnny Blackwell, I somehow managed to forget him going through the uh, biog. Johnny Blackwell, no, I didn't forget him. No, I, I, he, he's out there somewhere. Johnny Blackwell also looked at smoking <laughs> in ulcerous Um We know people who quit smoking are more likely to get ulcerative colitis. Um, and this has sort of acted as a deterrent on patients and clinicians um, and made them reluctant to recommend smoking cessation in this group. So we looked at the impact of smoking cessation on disease outcomes in UC. And you can see in this um, uh, analysis that there was no difference between smokers, ex-smokers, and smokers in the risk of colectomy and likewise steroid dependency. Um, so I think it's an important, uh, worthwhile public health message that we can feel empowered to encourage our patients to stop smoking you who know, have ulcerative colitis. Now I want to turn on turn to the sort of body of work we've done looking at the onset of GI symptoms and inflammatory bowel disease, uh, the time to diagnosis and the impact of delay. So just to remind you of the graph again, there's a long period here before you get the disease um, where you have symptoms, but you're undiagnosed. Um, and could it be, we hypothesise that if we could get in early, we could then reduce the risk of disease progression and subsequent complications in IBD. Um, and thereby prevent long-term bowel damage and progression in the natural history of the disease. So uh, using CPRD, Johnny Blackwell looked at GI symptoms amongst patients attending primary care in the years before their diagnosis and compared it with a control group. And what do you know? Um, 
GI symptoms uh, in patients who go on to develop IBD can occur up to 10 years before a diagnosis of IBD compared with this background level of GI symptoms in the, in the population. So there are people out there with preclinical symptoms undiagnosed. Um, and we found that people who were later diagnosed with IBD, less than 50% of them received review uh, by a specialist within 18 months from presenting chronic GI symptoms. And we also found a prior diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome uh, or a diagnosis of depression uh, increased the time taken to specialist referral. All quite important stuff if we want to get better at diagnosing our patients early and getting on the treatment. Of course, there are lots of steps contributing to the total time to diagnosis. <coughs> patients sit around with symptoms for a while before they consult for the first time, patient-related time, and then there's a period of time before they get referred to specialists, and sure enough, there's a period of time before they get diagnosed, um, and there's a period of time before then they get started on treatment, and that accounts for the total time to IBD diagnosis. Uh, so what do we know about the consequences of delay? Um, well, Shai has been looking at this in a systematic review, there are a number of publications in this field, uh, and most people define delay as uh, the 25th centile of patients, or the longest time to diagnosis. Um, and this is some of her work that she's presenting in abstract, and we hope to get published, um, of studies in Crohn's. We've replicated similar findings in UC, or a few studies. And Sure enough, if you have a delayed diagnosis, there's a twofold increase in the risk of surgery and a number of other, other clinical outcomes as well. And I think this is important. And I think that this is, finding points towards the need for enhanced national pathways to achieve more timely diagnosis. We have better ways of diagnosing uh, IBD than we ever used to with the use of surrogate markers like calprotectin. And I was really pleased to see that Crohn's and Colitis UK the charity in this field uh, have made this one of maybe their top priority in the coming few years and they also cited our work in their policy document. So uh, I, I hope that has made some small impact. On to um, turning now to the relationship between inflammatory bowel disease and the common mental health conditions, anxiety and depression. Churchill's black dog, um, something that's close to my heart. Um, and in common with other chronic conditions, there is a two-way relationship between mood and inflammatory bowel disease. One can exacerbate the other. Uh, we became interest, interested in the onset of depression. Um, and could that possibly be an etiological factor leading to the development of IBD? Uh, so we started working on it, and then whilst we were working on it, another research group scooped us. Um, I was very bereft when that first happened, <laughs> and I saw the paper in gut. But in fact, it made us look at the question quite differently, and look at the relationship between depression and the onset of GI symptoms before IBD diagnosis. So uh, what Johnny did, we looked at the onset of depression in the individuals who subsequently learned IBD. Sure enough, compared with the controls in blue, the IBD patients, Crohn's and UC, have a higher rate, of, a higher prevalence of depression in the years prior to their diagnosis, up to eight years. So you might think, oh, oh we've stumbled on the cure. Just treat the depression, everyone will get better. Um, but we then went on to look at the relationship to depression and GI symptoms. Um, so we found that um, depression in the absence of GI symptoms <coughs> is not in fact associated with the risk of subsequently developing IBD, but depression with previous GI symptoms was associated with a approximately 50% increased risk um, in developing, subsequently developing IBD um, compared to to controls, um, and and uh, and we got it published in Guts. So um, 
that, that, was, that was always the dream. So uh, more recently, we've been looking at antidepressant medication use in inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and this works with the Chinese done. This is the wonderful thing about virtual, uh, virtual abstracts, which all the journals make you do now, is it's so easy when you prepare a slide and you pass the information. I'm a great fan of virtual abstract. So we found that amongst IBD patients uh, in the first year of their diagnosis, they used a third more antidepressants than matched, con matched controls. But for a variety of reasons, only a third of these patients actually uh, take a full course of treatment. Um, and these individuals who don't complete their, their, their full course for whatever reason are young people and those from socio-economically deprived backgrounds. And uh, another piece of work in the same field that uh, Chris did um, is looking at the association between antidepressant medications, a sort of surrogate of mood disorder, if you like, and steroid dependency. And sure enough, if you're a continuous user of tricyclic or SSRI, you have a twofold increased risk of steroid dependency. And others have found, found similar findings. The thing about inaugural is you can just talk about all your own work and nobody else's. This <laughs> 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 is the joy uh, for the researcher. So um, a little aside, if you don't mind, mental health issues um, are an issue uh, that have touched my family and me. Um, strange as it may seem, mental health issues can also affect healthcare professionals, not just their patients. Um, and uh, I found myself a little bit of a black dog last year and had to take some time off work. Um, and I think doctors in particular um, often suffer in silence for fear of professional prejudice. And sometimes there may be an undercurrent of stigma or blame and sometimes self-stigma. Um, we are none of us superhumans and we need to recognise that. I mention it today openly because uh, if I can't talk about it as a senior clinician, who the hell can? Um, we need to normalise these conversations uh, for our own well-being. Uh, so I will move on from that topic <coughs> and briefly chat about diagnostic medical radiation and imaging in the diagnosis of IVD. This is something I've been interested in for a long time. Um, and uh, the SUC uh, did a lovely meta-analysis looking at the risk of uh, diagnostic medical radiation. It had become clear that there is a significant risk of excess exposure to radiation because it's a lifelong condition. Patients get a lot of scans. And we did this meta-analysis and sure enough we demonstrated that nearly 10% of IBD patients when we did this study uh, exceeded a threshold dose of 50 millisieverts of radiation, which is the threshold after which you have an increased cancer risk from radiation exposure. At the time we were using lots of things like barium follow-through and uh, CT. And uh, I was very keen to do um, MR enterography, um, but I couldn't get any access to the machine. There's only one machine in the hospital which was always breaking down. The orthopedic surgeons um, hogged it all. Um, so I started thinking about other ways of imaging our patients. And um, I got interested in ultrasound, so a couple of Italian groups had published on this, but it was really small print. Luckily enough, we had a wonderful ultrasonographer, James Pilcher, um, where when he does an ultrasound, we call his, his scans Pilcher grounds, uh, he's very talented at ultrasound. And we started to use intestinal ultrasound scanning routinely, um, uh, and have done really since the mid noughties um, and I, I think we were probably one of the very first centres in the UK uh, to start using ultrasound and I'm pleased to see that ultrasound is now the flavour of the month in the IBD world, point of care ultrasound, everyone is into it big time so, and I think that's a great thing and gastroenterologists are starting to train in ultrasound too. 
So this is our first paper on the topic. Um, James uh, revealing um, good coefficient of correlation between uh, ultrasound and imaging that we were using at the time, like CT. Uh, and actually, Suit won the paper of the year for the, from the journal for this piece of work. A quick shout out at this point for Shankar, Shankar Kumar, who at the time was a medical student at St George's Hospital, he came to me, wanted to do some research, and got him involved in this work. And he actually was then a co author on four subsequent papers uh, in the field. Um, he's now gone on to be an academic fellow in radiology. Uh, so, any medical students in the audience who are out there, you can do it if you're interested, you're motivated, um, and you apply yourself. You can you can get a great uh, you can get a great uh, publication record as a student if if you want. Well done, Shank. Um, so we then um, contributed to a large multi-centre study um, led by Stuart Taylor and colleagues at UCH, um, comparing MR enterography with ultrasound. Uh, and you'll see that ultrasound is a very good runner-up to MR enterography. But not only is it a good runner-up, patients actually often very much prefer ultrasound than going through a big banging magnet and having to say horrible stuff that gives them diarrhea. And uh, I can generally say that my research in this aspect of uh, uh, IBD has changed my clinical practice and the way I work. So, um, as I've got older, I appreciate working with external collaborators more and more. Uh, it, it's one of the great joys of research, actually. Uh, and I'll mention a couple of pieces of work just to uh, whet your appetite. Um, I know you're probably all looking forward to your drink in the medical school, school bar, but bear with me just a little longer. Uh, so, I was involved in the Holtip trial, which is um, uh, run by researchers uh, at the Clinical Trials Unit at the London School, big international uh, pragmatic trial. And I, I was lucky enough to be part of the writing committee on the paper and working with the clinical research facility at St George's Hospital and the excellent team of emergency department nurses at uh, St George's. We were one of the largest recruiters to the study in the world, as Jeremy Clarkson would say. Um, <laughs> and um, it asked the question, does tranexamic acid, a drug that's been around for years, reduce the risk of acute GI bleeding? Many thought the answer was obviously yes, since there have been a lot of other publications with other forms of bleeding which have come out positively. To the extent that the, uh, the, the organisers of the trial nearly didn't get funding for it, but somehow they, they, they got it through, um, and and it, tranexamic has got so much traction, it's starting to be used routinely in clinical practice. People just prescribe it, um, even though the evidence base uh, was lacking. Um, and I think this demonstrates the importance of a <coughs> negative study. So there was no benefit <coughs> from this drug whatsoever in reducing risk from GI bleeding. Um, and um, up to that point, we really hadn't been practicing evidence-based medicine. So I, was, I, was, I really enjoyed being part of that process. Um, two years ago, who would have anticipated what we were about to face? Uh, warning, rocks falling, COVID pandemic on the way. My second pandemic that I've experienced during my career. A silver lining to, to the pandemic has been the incredible collaboration um, that UK researchers have been involved with during this time. I think sort of we really stand out internationally in that regard. <coughs> and I was glad to be part of the action in some small way. I will mention this study, um, which was, uh, I, uh, it was a great joy to be involved with, with working with Taryn Karma, Nick Kennedy, uh, and others. Um, extraordinarily, in a three month period, they recruited 7,000 patients from about 100 IBE centres, mainly in the UK. Um, and the study was designed to look at the immune response to COVID vaccination in patients on different biologic infusions. Uh, so essentially, there was a comparison between Velalizumab, for those of you who don't know, um, 
works uh, directly on the gut and inflicts in that, which has a more systemic action on the immune response. And you can see here that this, show, this slide shows an attenuated immune response in the infliximab users with a more rapidly waning immune response uh, to vaccine. But fortunately, <clears throat> further work um, in the group has found no increased risk of severe COVID in, in this IBD cohort. But it, I, I, I love being part of this uh, group. I, I think most, most of us in IBD were involved in, in this study. So this slide, to briefly flag up some of the other collaborations I've been involved in, um, I can't go into them in detail, but IBD Boost with Christine Norton, uh, looking at pain and fatigue, uh, uh, IBD Virus Source with Miles Parks, Profile, which stands to be a landmark trial uh, in IBD, um, we hope, um, and more recently with the Global Burden of Disease Collaboration. Um, I thank you for working with and for organisations like BSG, NICE, doing the use of uh, approval process, Spotlight Project with the Royal College of Practitioners, um, and thank you, thank you also to the funders uh, who uh, funded some of my work along the way. <clears throat> so, what of the future? Well, we've started some new work looking at pain uh, and opiate use in inflammatory bowel disease. And uh, uh, Sammy uh, uh, is doing this work. Um, this this sort of sums it, sums it up. Uh, I think I've become a more holistic doctor as I've got older. Uh, this is a nice quote from a, uh, a paper from Christy Norton's group, a, a qualitative paper, a quote from a patient. If they ask you how you are and you say, well, I have pain, they're like, yes, but the bloods don't show any inflammation, so you're fine. It's very dismissive of pain, unless you've got some other symptoms. And I think really <coughs> we're very bad at treating people with pain um, because we think, oh, I don't know what to do, I can't do it, I can't manage it. So uh, that's what's given me an interest in it. And this uh, is the first bit of work that Sammy's done, looking at opiate exposure in inflammatory bowel disease in a in a uh, national audit um, led with Christian Selinger um, of a thousand patients looking at opiate use and you can see that more than 10% of patients with IV are on opiates many of them, many of whom are on them long term these are the risk factors associated with uh, opiate use and importantly most of them actually don't have active disease at all so we're going on now using CPRZ to look at long-term opiate use and I hope this will inform our decisions and our knowledge of how we can better control pain because opiates aren't, aren't the right option for long-term chronic pain for most people. Uh, so going full circle, arcing back on myself, it's back to the future. See what I did there? Uh, back to the parasites, um, doing entomeva histolytica management guidelines in the BSG World College of Pathologist um, uh, guidelines working committee. And uh, it's good to be back with my old friends again. So, um, if you will indulge me, a few thank yous. Um, uh, so, first and foremost, uh, thank you. To my patients, um, I, um, I think most clinicians are motivated by their patients, and uh, I can't put a photo up of all of my patients, but this is a photo of one of them. In order to say thank you to all of them, um, uh, and um, her story is close. This lady's story is close to my heart because my father had bowel cancer. Deborah James, you don't know her, also known as Bowel Babe, um, uh, was I, 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 uh, is known to many thousands of patients with uh, bowel cancer, um, and it's very inspiring um, because I, I first met her um, when I diagnosed her with bowel cancer in her mid thirties. She's a local school headmistress, and um, she had advanced bowel cancer involving her liver and her lung, 
I can say this because she talks about this all on Twitter, so I'm not breaking any confidence. Um, but um, I think this, uh, her history, um, could, could be a, a, a better illustration of the importance of early diagnosis. Um, but I'm pleased to say this picture was taken over five years ago, and uh, she is still going strong. Uh, despite multiple causes of chemotherapy and umpteen surgeries, she is, she is a tour de force, extraordinary woman. So thank you, patients. Thank you to John uh, Friedman, and Jenny Hyam, Tom Harrison, and Julian Marr. As a full-time trust employee, I appreciate the support of SGL uh, with my career, uh, my academic career, despite uh, it not being my day job. Um, I do passionately believe that research improves the care um, of our patients and benefits our patients. And I think it's so important that our trust recognise this and don't just pay lip service to it. Many thanks uh, to the SGR team. I couldn't go without saying a word of thanks to the Department of Gastroenterology. I can't name them all, obviously. Here are my lovely consultant colleagues. Um, I consider myself lucky because, by and large, we all get on pretty well, um, which I know is not always the case in some departments. Um, I could point out one or two people um, if we have time. I'm not sure if we do. But I would just mention Dan Fulton, who's been a, a great leader uh, for research in the trust and forging links with the medical school. Uh, um, I perhaps shouldn't go through all of them, otherwise you may definitely go to sleep. Um, this is a, a picture of me when I had a bit more hair. <laughs> <laughs> My dear mother, who's now turned 90, I couldn't let the talk go without saying something about her. And finally, a special word of thanks for my number one collaborator, Professor Sonia Saxena in the audience in the lovely green dress. Um, and our most important research output has been Jane and Nina, our children, <laughs> um, who in turn are growing up to be independent researchers themselves. Um, so I know, I hope my children are out there somewhere. Jane and Nina, I hope you tuned in. Um, <laughs> that's pretty much all I have to say. So, what is being a prof meant to me? Well, it's good to have a little bit of recognition. Um, it helps my imposter syndrome, and I'm sure it's going to empower me to support all those young researchers out there who discover the joy of doing research. So, um, on that note, I hope you uh, will join me for a drink in the medical school bar. If you can find your way there, we will, we will steer you if, you if you're not sure. Thank you for listening. It gives me a huge, it's a huge privilege to be asked to give a vote of thanks um, after your amazing inaugural lecture and to share the honour with my friend and colleague, Professor Elsa Hart, who will follow on from me. We're very mindful of, of that picture up there. <laughs> We've been told to keep it brief, so that is indeed what we should do. Um, but thank you. you you've <coughs> just taken us on an absolutely fantastic journey through an incredibly wide ranging research career which has gone from the hardcore sort of molecular biology, infectious diseases to epidemiology and you say much more holistic and collaborative um, ventures in, in recent years. And I think it's I think it's really illustrated all the facets of your character which were really brought out. So incredible, you know, sort of scientific mm -hmm. curiosity and curiosity about life actually. Um, very, very reflective um, person who Take, take took a lot of time to, um, despite having the, a brain the size of the planet, 
very, very self-effacing um, and really taking the time to make sure that everybody was credited, you know, for everything that happened and all, all the sort of collaboration that happened and, and with your research fellows along the way. Um, and along with all of those things, apart from your sort of intelligence and your, you know, your, 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 your real interest in asking the bigger questions and looking deeper into things, um, always that sort of innate thespian tendency um, and sense of mischief <laughs> of, and, and sense of humour, which I think we've, we've all come to know you for. So um, as, as, you, as you suggested, we, we met when we were doing our first registrar jobs at the Chelsea Westminster Hospital at the time as with the, in the first pandemic, as you, as you said, um, many, many parallels in terms of sort of fear and ignorance and you know, a lot of uncertainty, but also enormous um, opportunities in terms of um, asking more questions about what's happening and, and for research. And, you know, I think even as I met you, I could see you'd already done so much, but even by the time I first met you and I felt I'd done literally nothing, um, that, you know, even then I could see, you know, this sort of spirit of scientific inquiry and this real quest for, for knowledge and wanting to sort of take things further and, and, and to learn things. Um, and then obviously we've been, so we've known each other 30 years um, as colleagues and, and, and very close friends. And we have been colleague, um, colleagues at St George's Hospital for the last 20 years. And just as a, just a, apart from the fact that you are just an incredibly valued um, and inspirational colleague within the department, um, I just wanted to say just a quick word really about um, your research fellows and your, your supervisory skills, I guess, before I hand over to Ailsa and we all go to the bar. Um, because I think, you know, you, you, there was, you marked a sea change or created a sea change, I think, when you came to St George's um, from a time when, shall we say, um, completion rates of higher awards have been somewhat um, flaky um, or not so predictable. Um, but with your sort of arrival, you have since had a 100% success rate in, in actually guiding your, your um, research fellows through to successful awards and success and, and su successive consultant mm. colleagues have done the same. So I think I've, I'm, I, I take zero credit for this because I'm probably about the rest, most research inactive person in the department, but of the colleagues who are here, you know, again, you know, it, it's just followed that trend. And, and um, I think, you know, you provide a great role model in that. So I felt thinking about your research fellows, I probably ought to just ask them what they thought of you. Just uh, <laughs> so, um, I'll keep it clean. Um, so I'm just I'm just going to read out a few quotes. I mean, obviously, some of them are here. And thank you very much to those that I sort of uh, were haranguing for, for comments. But I think that's not fair because they were, they were very, very willing to bring them. But just the themes, basically the themes that pretty much everybody mentioned was your huge supportiveness and, and kindness. And, and that was just the universal thing, which absolutely every every single person that I um, spoke to said. Um, but I'll just read out some, some, some quotes. So this is one, perhaps the perfect research supervisor. He always had novel ideas that he would plant, nourish and let his fellows run with. He always provided a nurturing education environment without smothering the trainee. Pretty good. Continuously encouraging. Always an optimist about an idea, research, aim or paper. He always encouraged and gave subtle hints to improve or collaborate. And I've been impressed by how he can recall every detail of all of his previous fellows' work, even those from many years ago. And it demonstrates how much he invests in every project, particularly remarkable when contrasted with his inability to remember any of his passwords. <laughs> <laughs> there are a number of, there are enough, there is lots of comments about your sense of humour and your sense of mission as well. And a number of anecdotes that I think probably will be better shared in the medical school bar than in this esteemed environment. But before um, I hand over to Elsa, I also just want to say thank you, Richard, for your um, honesty and courage in um, talking about the mental health issues related to healthcare professionals and indeed to you. And I think the more that we can do that, as you said, I think the more that we can actually encourage people to talk about this. And I think particularly following COVID, it, it, it's become a, a huge issue. So thank you for that. I'm just going to hand it to us. Thanks, Kelly. So thank you, Richard, for the invitation to give this, uh, this vote of thanks today. So this is all for you, Richard, Professor Pollock, uh, on the occasion of your inaugural lecture today. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure being here with you all. I really enjoyed the lecture. It was honest. It was all encompassing. It really took the whole journey, the breadth and depth of what you've done is, is phenomenal. Penny, you've given the words from the perspective of the hospital, maybe. What I'd like to do is give some broader words from the, the whole UK uh, community of gastroenterologists. So in preparation for this one, you asked me a few months ago, I've done the length and the breadth of the country, and with all sorts of opinions and colleagues all over the place. 
Um, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 360 assessment. But again, as Penny has said, you are hugely adored around the country. Some of the words that have been used uh, were highly intelligent, incredibly supportive, motivated, caring, understated, and a great sense of humour. One that came around the WhatsApp just when you were talking there was he's the gentleman of gastroenterology, a valuable contributor to IBD research and epidemiology with a common sense approach. I thought that was just perfect. I know you're committed to your fellows, um, all of whom have achieved their high degrees, as Penny has said, that's a great achievement. Uh, and I understand that patients also adore you. So I've been carefully tipped that they describe you as their favourite uncle. <laughs> now that's no sense of your age, that's think of the diabetes patients are obviously young. Uh, and I know you're highly valued by your colleagues, exactly as Penny said. I've had the opportunity to know you personally through the IG Boost programme, uh, that you mentioned with Chris Norton. I know we both share the passion about trying to help patients with pain, fatigue and some of these issues. I've also got to know you through the IBD forum, uh, which has been fantastic. Everything you do there is valued and entirely relevant. Just personally, on the IBD COVID chat, so we had a WhatsApp chat throughout the pandemic, and honestly, I think it kept the same, most gastroenterologists same throughout these last two years. I could always guarantee that whatever Richard put on the chat, it was going to be relevant, important, or highly amusing. <laughs> One of those things. So thank you for that. Maybe something you don't know about Richard, though, or maybe you do, actually. And that, again, is from one of your colleagues here, that you are an electric on the dance floor. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, you're incredible. Uh, you're regarded and well-respected by all your colleagues. Uh, and I'm delighted to be making um, this devotion thanks to you today. Thank you very much. So most people, if you just go out this door, it's sort of up the stairs opposite, and we'll guide you in that direction if you don't know where you're going. If you can't manage two flights of stairs,